Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a show where we will provide you fresh insights into South Asia's geopolitical, strategic and security situation. Let's take a look at the headlines first. UN report states Taliban aiding terror groups in Afghanistan. Minorities continue to face persecution under Park's blasphemy laws. And Indian security forces slash Pakistan's efforts at terror financing. After the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan, terror groups have more freedom in Afghanistan than at any time in recent history. And there is no evidence that the Taliban leadership has made steps to curtail the activities of foreign terrorists in the war-torn country. According to a recent UN report, the connection between the Taliban, Al-Qaeda and several other terror groups remains strong and mutually beneficial for all parties involved, with the Taliban serving as the nucleus of the entire setup harboring terror activities, a report. Since the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan, following the US withdrawal in August 2021, the country once again has become a hotbed of terrorism. Terror groups are now able to operate freely under the Taliban's authority in Afghanistan, posing a significant threat of terrorism in the country and the wider region. According to a recent report by the Analytical Support and Sanctions Monitoring Team of the UN Security Council, the link between Afghanistan's Taliban regime and Al-Qaeda remains strong and symbiotic, and the setup in Kabul has not delivered on counterterrorism provisions under the Doha Agreement signed with the US. According to the UN, Al-Qaeda has established training camps in five Afghan provinces, as well as safe houses and other infrastructure across the country. The Al-Qaeda camps are located in five provinces in five different regions of Afghanistan. Helmand in the south, Zabul in the southeast, Nangarhar in the east, Nuristan in the northeast, as well as Burgis in the west. The presence of Al-Qaeda camps in Helmand, Zabul, Nuristan and Nangarhar should come as no surprise. Helmand province has long been fertile ground for Al-Qaeda. In 2015, FDD's Long War Journal reported that Al-Qaeda was operating a training camp in Bramcha of Helmand province. For consolidation of Al-Qaeda or reconsolidation of Al-Qaeda have been ongoing for a very long time. Uh, even when the Taliban was not in power. Right now they have been given a reasonable space to consolidate. But there is no evidence of any dramatic change in the capacities and capabilities. In fact, their leadership has been decimated. Second line leaders are being decimated. Uh, Ayman Zawahiri was killed uh, in Afghanistan uh, uh, last year, middle last year, July, I think. Uh, today, the uh, nominal head or the acting uh, Amir, uh, Saif al Adal, he is uh, believed to be in Iran is himself under tremendous pressure. So, while it is true that the conditions within Afghanistan may be such that they would allow some groups to consolidate, there is as yet no evidence of this happening. Al-Qaeda has used the Taliban's takeover to attract new recruits and funding and its affiliates worldwide. Despite Al-Qaeda's huge network in Afghanistan, which includes training camps, safe houses, a media operation center, and Al-Qaeda commanders serving in the Taliban government, the U.S. has only executed one hit since its withdrawal. That strike, which killed Zawahari, was conducted by the CIA. The Biden administration touted the ability to hit Al-Qaeda and other terror groups if their presence is discovered using over-the-horizon counter-terrorism capabilities of the U.S. military. However, the U.S. military has conducted zero counter-terrorism strikes since the withdrawal. The only option that we see available to the West right now is covert operations and drone strikes. They took out Ayman Zawahiri right in the middle of Kabul. And whenever they detect a consolidation of either leadership or of Carders in particular places with detect uh, training camps which they are able to uh, authoritatively identify 
they are likely to take them out. The kind of situation that occurred prior to 9-11 is unlikely to occur now because levels of tolerance are low and more importantly there are no diplomatic or legal constraints. They will hit them when they like. The Taliban's victory in Afghanistan has not only provided the space for openly organizing the training camps, but has also inspired terrorist organizations of various hues. Besides Al-Qaeda, Pakistan lashkar e taiba jaish e Muhammad, and the Islamic State of Khorasan, East Turkestan Islamic Movement has also become active in Afghanistan. The 13th report of the Analytical Support and Sanctions Monitoring Team claims that Jaish e Muhammad maintains eight training camps in Nangarhar, three of which are directly under Taliban control. All of these indicate that while the Taliban assurances for not letting the terrorists operate from its soil have remained on paper, in reality, the Taliban administration is helping them. The time has come for the international community to decide on how to bring about a permanent ceasefire and an immediate cessation of violence in Afghanistan. Anything short of this will constitute a serious threat to regional peace and security. Well, Pakistan, a country that has a long list of self-generated problems to deal with, has still not given up on becoming a support system for terrorists that are making desperate attempts to disturb the peace and tranquility in the Jammu and Kashmir. However, India's capable defense forces are carefully weeding out this network of terror financing. In a recent incident, the properties of a Kashmiri businessman were seized in the Kupwara district of Jammu and Kashmir. We have a report. The raids by National Investigation Agency this time were conducted on the properties belonging to Zahur Ahmed Shah Vatali, a Kashmiri businessman from Hanwara. Vatali was arrested in 2017 under the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. The action against the accused was taken after the special NIA court, Patiala House, had issued an order. A terror financing network basically is a financial support system for organizations or individuals for carrying out terrorist activities. According to the charge sheet filed against Watali, he is accused of being a conduit, transferring funds that he received from suspicious sources. The document also mentioned that his terror financing sources belong to Pakistan and Dubai and the funds received were used for repeated attacks on security forces, government establishments, inflicting damage to public property. Not being the first one, the raids on Vatali's properties is yet another addition to several successful raids done by national and state investigation agencies in the past. There have been verified attempts from Pakistan trying to infiltrate terrorists from the Indo-Pak border, the latest of them being in May this year, when a group of unspecified number of terrorists was stopped by India's army after an exchange of fire in the Uri sector. Furthermore, there have been several confirmed sightings of drones trying to enter the Indian aerospace with truck packages near India's international border. Several media reports suggest that there have been 311 drone sightings last year. Not only that, as per the year-end review of 2022 by the Ministry of Defence, there have been 12 infiltration attempts and 18 foreign terrorist encounters alongside the entire border shared by India and Pakistan. By these futile attempts, Pakistan tries its best to keep Kashmir issue on boil, which it has been continuously trying to push on international platforms. The army is now being targeted. That army is the one that has made a fool of the people. And that is why the same army and ISI requires that the Kashmir issue is kept on a boil. And after now the successful completion of the G20 summit in Kashmir, it is a big slap on the face of the Pakistan army and Pakistan establishment. And it has shown to the people that what 
all propaganda that was being done by Pakistan establishment and the army was all wrong. The Indian Jammu Kashmir is far far much better developed, has more rights, have people are more freer than what they are in Pakistan occupied Jammu Kashmir. Allying with the terrorists that desperately try to hinder peace here in India, experts believe that there is an elaborate network of overground workers in the area targeted by Pak-sponsored terrorists. These individuals are the ones providing terrorists with all the local support that is needed, starting from real-time information to shelter and even provide weapons at times. Be it terror financing, narco-terrorism via drones, infiltration attempts across the international border or the network of the overground workers that act as a local support system. Islamabad has not differed itself from anti-India activities. They are sending in drones with drugs and arms ammunition to their people, the underground overground workers over here in Jammu Kashmir and telling them that you sell this drug and the money that you get from it that you use for your terror financing, giving it to people for stone pelting and whatever other reasons. Now this is the way that they are doing it because Pakistan does not have any funds to really now do and upkeep all these terrorists that it has been doing all these 75 years. Even when their own people are suffering on every aspect, the neighboring country is not ready to take countermeasures against terrorism. However, such terrorism is and will be countered by India's valiant security forces on every front imaginable, regardless how much Pakistan may try. Pakistan is among the countries where blasphemy is punishable by death. In many instances, the accused are killed by mobs before legal proceedings even begin. Often, it is members of religious minorities who end up being accused of blasphemy. Recently, a Christian man, Noman Masi, has been sentenced to hang on blasphemy charges after receiving a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad, a report. <laughs> Blasphemy is a sensitive topic in Pakistan, where 97% of the population is Muslim. Hundreds of people have been imprisoned in Pakistan under the blasphemy law for years. The latest victim is Christian man, Noman Masi. He has been sentenced to hang on blasphemy charges after receiving a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad. Pakistan's blasphemy laws criminalize anyone who insults Islam, with punishments including the death penalty and life imprisonment. According to media reports, the man that sent the cartoon to Masi, a Muslim, has not received any form of punishment. Pakistan has been staunchly criticized for its extreme blasphemy laws, which critics say are used to persecute and intimidate members of religious minorities. 1947, uh, their Qaeda-e-Azam Jannah said that this is a country for everybody. <clears throat> that time, large number of Hindus, other Muslims who are not Sunnis, others, there are Christians who live there. They thought that it was their country. I mean, they could continue to work there. Uh, but everybody had to leave now from Sindh and all the Sindhis and uh, Kashmiris, the others. Everybody is suffering, uh, basically. And there has been a targeted policy against the minorities in the country. Their numbers have significantly reduced. You know, and so the, the, the persecution of minorities uh, is a matter that has been taken uh, cognizance of by the international communities about the human rights of the minorities and everything that is very much evident. Now, is it good for Pakistan? That is for their only governance architecture to see that they are losing an, an excellent resource which could have given the country a different kind of a meaning. So what they are doing is uh, actually quite condemnable. No Man Masi is one among the thousands of cases charged under blasphemy in Pakistan. Earlier in April, a Chinese national was victimized under Pakistan's blasphemy laws in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province when he allegedly made some remarks 
against Allah. The Chinese national identified as Mr. Tian was described by the local police as a transportation supervisor at Dasu Hydropower project. The Chinese supervisor was allegedly dissatisfied with the slow pace of work during Ramadan season that led to a heated argument between the Chinese supervisor and the Muslim workers. Soon he was circled by the mob of Muslim workers and later arrested by the police on charges of blasphemy. In August 2021, an eight-year-old Hindu boy was charged under the draconian law and nearly escaped death penalty. In the same year, a Sri Lankan national in the city of Sialkot was beaten to death over allegations of blasphemy. In 2019, Nutan Lal, a teacher from Hindu minority in Sindh province, was later sentenced to life imprisonment. It is appalling that several minorities were targeted and killed on mere suspicion of blasphemy by the mob itself before Pakistan's law could take its course. Well, blasphemy is <clears throat> unfortunately so subjective. And uh, that is the, in my view, that is the bane of all religions. And this is something that needs an open mind, an open debate. And if you radicalize your youth to this extent as you mentioned, or going by those archaic values, uh, I think you can't uh, think of a civilized future for a country. Violence in the name of religion is dangerously rampant in Pakistan. The in-depth roots of religious extremism are turning the entire inhabitants of the country into religious zealots. The ruling class, whether military or civil, has exploited religion to give legitimacy and popularity to its regime, instead of curbing the menace of fundamentalism. According to a recent US report on international religious freedom stated that law enforcement in Pakistan failed to protect religious minorities and individuals accused of blasphemy. The Center for Social Justice and NGO reported 84 cases of blasphemy filed in 2021 and 199 in 2020. Fundamentalism, extremism and terrorism have grown so much that now it has become difficult for the Pakistani government to control this menace, which wants to take the society to pre-Islamic days. Well, a recent spike in the number of drone sightings at the Indo-Pak border trying to infiltrate from India's airspace has been noticed. The most recent one of these was reported at the Indo-Pak border near Tarantaran district of Punjab this week. Several similar drone sightings have also been reported near the JNK border this year. Notably, these drones carry illegal drug consignments which are dropped on India's side. The use of drones in this manner is yet another elaborate scheme of Pakistan to push narco-terrorism in border areas. To know more about the issue, we are joined by the banker Sen Gupta, Professor of Economics at the University of Jammu. So, Professor Dipankar, a recent spike in drone sightings carrying illegal drug packages has been intercepted by the border security forces. Do you think that Pakistan's narcotic trade is a two-pronged strategy? On one hand, it serves as a money mentor for state-sponsored terrorism. On the other, it attempts to get Indian youngsters hooked on illegal drugs. And what do you think? How are youth falling prey to the gangster terrorist network? So two things happen. One is Pakistan earns money, a lot of money through this particular trade. The second one is an entire generation A is demotivated. They lose motivation, hope for the future, etc. And therefore they become the perfect ground to spread instability. Because some will be angry at the turn of events and this anger can always be used against India. So. This is a win-win situation for Pakistan where a generation is spoiled and this generation among the spoiled generation you get your recruits for terrorism and jihad and you also mon earn money on the sidelines. So this is a self-financing trick which they have tried earlier in Afghanistan and they are trying it now in India. 
Right. Uh, narco terrorism is an integral component of Pakistan state sponsorship of cross border terrorism used so as to fund and conduct asymmetric warfare against its neighbors. What's your take? What should be India's strategy to handle this security threat? Firstly, your law and order has to evolve. Just as the Pakistani agencies have changed their modes of, uh, of uh, smuggling, they are using drones. You also have to change your technology to ensure that you start to intercept these particular drones. So Indian law and order agencies have to invest heavily in technology, IT enabled technology, artificial intelligence, so as to ensure that you are able to stop this merchandise at the border itself. But simultaneously, I think our educational institutions, our social institutions also have to come into play. You know, you also have to tell your youth that, you know, these are not the things that you have to go into. Well, how can Pakistan propagate narco-terrorism in India if it suffers from food shortages and economic slowdowns? See, I think this is a logical outcome of Pakistani twisted thinking. The fact is the Pakistani uh, economy is collapsing, inflation is sky high. Uh, they cannot service their debts. They are looking around to, from one capital to another capital asking for a, a loan, a handout to tide them by for, an, for the next few weeks. So under those circumstances, a strategy such as this, which tries to take away the attention from Pakistan to India, is a good one in their way. In their uh, twisted moral universe, if they undertake drug smuggling, which gives them money, and in return, if your neighbor's generation is spoiled, as, had, as has happened in Afghanistan, the Pakistani establishment unfortunately thinks it as a win-win situation. We are grappling with a neighbor whose moral compass has ceased to exist. So how can India crack down on Pakistan's sponsored terrorism here in Jammu and Kashmir? I think... Our machinery that tackles drugs has to be strengthened and prosecution for ownership of drugs and taking of drugs has to be swift and it has to be vigorous. If somebody is dealing with drugs, he has to be prosecuted to the full extent of law. I think this message has to go out internally when it comes to law enforcement and our students have to be encouraged to uphold certain moral values which itself will ensure that they do not go in for drugs. Right. Uh, thank you so much for the insight, sir. And with that, we come to the end of the edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Lipakshi Kurana signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.